Good evening, I'm Joe Holder, pastor of Little Zion Primitive Baptist Church in Bellflower, California. Welcome to our Wednesday evening virtual service. I hope you notice the announcement on the pastor's corner that we're starting a half hour early tonight. And unless this is an inconvenience for those of you who, who join with me, this will be our new time to begin our, our streaming each week from, from now forward. I'm on the West Coast. For many of you who, who watch it, you're on the East Coast, you're in an earlier time zone, so it makes it more late at night. So trying to accommodate you and in some ways, my own schedule as well. So I hope it works out, but I would appreciate your feedback. Let me know whether it's better or worse and what you think about it. I've made another change in the format for tonight. I've, I've been trying to include a hymn in each of the streaming uh, recordings, but the, all of the steps to, to do that compromise the quality of the hymns you hear. I, I have a source of digital hymns that I have accessed from the beginning. I play them on my computer, my desktop uh, speakers, and record them on my streaming microphone. <laughs> By the time we go through all of those steps, with each step, I think quality goes down. So Earlier today, in the announcement of tonight's message, I posted a, a link for you to just click on that link, and it will take you directly to the digital recording. And I will encourage each of you, and when you when you see that that announcement of the hymn, I'd encourage you to go to it and listen to it at some time prior to the evening message. I try to choose a hymn. That, that is fitting and appropriate to the message I have on my mind for that night. So a few minor changes. I hope they work out better for, for you and for your enjoyment and study of our time together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for today, for the blessings of life that you give us. We pray that you would remind us so frequently and and with conviction and clarity that your goodness never fails. You're always with us. You're always kind and you bless us. Our life, when we survey it from a realistic perspective with you, however difficult the path, however challenging the trials, it's so much better than it could possibly be without you. Thank you, Father, for being a faithful, kind, and, and good friend who sticks closer than a brother who never forsakes us, but who's always there when we need you. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are struggling with life difficulties. We pray especially, Father, for those who have lost loved ones in recent days and are struggling with what lies ahead in their lives and their future without those whom they have learned to love, trust, and depend on so much. We have in mind several uh, dear friends, and we pray your kind and loving grace and sustaining power and, and comfort with them, especially at this time. We pray your blessings on the time together tonight. Bless me with clear thoughts and, and expression so that I will not speak in words that confuse, but rather with clarity and encouragement. And bless those who hear, to hear with focused hearts and minds to concentrate on the testimony of Scripture and how that Scripture and its teachings directs them to apply the Word to their lives, to live it, not just think about it or talk about it, but to live it and practice it in their daily lives. Father, bless us in all these and whatever other areas you know, we need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be trying, to, if, if time allows this evening, to cover Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11 through 17. It's quite, a, quite an expanse of ideas and thoughts, but uh, you pray and we'll try to stay on task and target the best we can. Hebrews 11 gives us a catalog of Old Testament saints 
and briefly how they applied and used faith, biblical faith, in the needs and circumstances of their life and serving God in the Old Testament era. There are a lot of differences, vast differences in, in them and their circumstance and ours. The greatest difference is the fact that Jesus had not come when they experienced these things, and faith showed them he would come, but they hadn't seen him yet. He had not yet come. We have the glorious privilege and advantage over them of Jesus having come, and we can read in the testimony of Scripture, the New Testament, the record of his coming and what he has done for us and what he has taught us how to live so as to honor and to serve him. When we go into chapter 12, I, I believe the, the wisest course to take as we begin studying chapter 12 is to think of chapter 12 as something of a handbook for New Testament believers. How should we use, practice, and live by biblical faith as New Testament believers today? It tells us how to live. In some cases, quite clearly how not to live. In Hebrews 11, some of those Old Testament saints, perhaps all of them, wandered as strangers and they looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. And we're told that God was not ashamed to be called their God because he had prepared for them a city. Right in the middle of chapter 12, Paul reminds us, we are on a journey and we're going to a city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, something we have in common with those Old Testament saints. So it not only tells us how to live, it tells us where to look, to whom we should look, and how that look should encourage and strengthen our faith as we live here. The lesson before us tonight uh, springboards from the lesson that I spoke on Sunday morning at the church on godly chastening, the Lord's chastening of his people to correct and to instruct his family. Chastening is family correction. It's not legal punishment, never at all. I can't imagine such a thing. And so if we build on the premise of godly chastening in the family of God, what does our response look like? How should we respond? What should we do? What should we not do? Instead of pursuing our imagination, which we tend on so often to do, we should look at the context of the, te of the lesson. And that's what I will do in part this evening. Context always in Scripture answers our questions if we will respect it. Look at context, listen to context, think about context, draw your thoughts, your faith, and your ideas from context. Don't take your thoughts and ideas to context. Draw your thoughts from it. And if you do that, you'll discover every action of faith listed and every discouragement of things not to do and how, to, and how not to live. Everything in chapter 12 is addressed to us and for us as the godly reaction when the Lord does chasten us. With that, let's begin our study of these verses. I covered briefly verse 11 in the last message. Let's start there again this evening. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I love symbolism and analogies in scripture, I'm cautious with them, much more so than many of my peers. But when scripture gives us a symbol, we should feel free to use it when, when we use it contextually. In this case, Paul introduces the symbol of a tree and the fruit it bears. It's a good tree and it bears good fruit. I'm thankful that he gives us this tree and its fruit analogy 
to chastening and our right, our faith reaction to chastening and the result, the fruit that a right reaction to chastening, a faith reaction to chastening, to be honest, will produce. I am so thankful for that. Our faith response, the right response, the wrong response will not become the tree that produces peaceable righteousness. It will not. Only the right faith response that God has told us and commanded us in serving him to pursue after chastening comes our way becomes the tree that grows and produces to full maturity the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which becomes the fruit the tree bears. Let's look at this, this, this fruit from the tree. It's peaceable. Our response to chastening should never be angry and warlike or resentful. It should be submissive and loving and appreciative of God to love us enough to chasten and show us his right way. And it should create in us a peaceable heart toward other believers, not an angry or resentful or envious heart. Not at all. It fosters a quiet and peaceable relationship with God and with other believers. Believers who agree with us, believers who don't agree with us. We should respect the family relationship if they're believers in Jesus, they're members of the family of God. We should respect them. We've got to spend eternity with them. Let's respect them and love them and be gracious and peaceable toward them now while we live to honor the Lord's chastening and to show by conduct we have learned that great lesson from him. Although James deals not with the response to so chastening and the peaceable fruit of righteousness, he, I believe, gives us a fairly significant parallel in the third chapter of James. Uh, wisdom that's from below and wisdom that's from above. He, he builds this foundation on how we use our speech, our tongue. But let me just focus very specifically from verse 14 down. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. If you're bitter, you have no reason to be happy, proud, or to, to, to feel smug with yourself. You have reason to, to, to fear the Lord's chastening coming yet again upon you and to look for reasons to repent and to remove that bitterness. Lie not and glory not against the truth. Glory not and lie not against the truth. So there's something that grows out of bitter envy and strife. Verse 15, this wisdom, wisdom that grows out of bitter envy and strife. You call that wisdom? The people who are controlled by those two emotions often think they're the smartest people in the world, but they're not. This wisdom descendeth not from above. You didn't get this from God but is earthly, sensual, devilish. James uses three descriptive terms to describe this earthly, unwise wisdom. It doesn't come from God. It's earthly. It, pertain, it pertains to earth, not to that world above. It's sensual. It's mere human nature uh, covered over or clothed with a wardrobe of spiritual pride. It does not refer to or grow out of our spiritual nature, which the Lord gives us. And finally, it is devilish. It is linked to the demonic. <laughs> that's, that's something we should work hard to eliminate in our lives. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. <laughs> Do you want to go there? I hope not. It's not a happy place to be. Then verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above 
This is God's wisdom given to his people. This is where we need to anchor our hearts and minds and build our lives around this wisdom that comes from God from above. This, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. If you think your wisdom gives you an entitlement to, to draw your sword and be harsh and critical and, and prideful, you're not responding to the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God will prompt you as a good response to chastening in our study passage to peaceableness. Gentle, not harsh and overt and, and, and brutal and blunt, but gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. What a powerful compliment to our lesson in, Hebrew, in, in Hebrews 12. What is this, the, the whole reaction that we will respond to the Lord's chastening? Will we respond with wisdom that is from above? Or will we respond with the wisdom that is from below? It will make an incredible difference in the outcome. Our reaction to chastening will become a mold for the rest, for the entirety of our lives. If we respond to chastening by faith, it will produce repentance and from repentance, peaceable spiritual fruit righteousness. And in verse 13b, the closing of verse 13, rather let it be healed. So if we respond to chastening by faith, the Lord will step into our lives and help us to find healing for the wounds we often have self-inflicted, inflicted upon ourselves and our unbelief and our rebellion against him and his family. If we respond with no faith, buckle your seatbelt, friend. More chastening is on its way, and it increasingly will become more severe. You think the, the chastening you had already is bad? <laughs> it's going to get worse if you don't respond to what the Lord has already sent your way. There's another subtlety. You know, it's not so subtle in reality, but it's subtle in terms of your, your thoughts and your response in that frame of mind. The adversary monitors your conduct and your attitude closely. If he sees you at all controlled or influenced by a, a bitter or angry or envious spirit, he will begin his persuasive work, and he is a good persuader. Be aware, he will try every way possible to convince you that the mirror opposite to God's teachings and God's warnings are true, are reality. What did he do with Eve in the Garden of Eden? God said, don't eat, you'll die. What does Satan say? Oh, God really knows that you can eat it and you won't really die at all. He, he tried to convince, and he did convince Eve and Adam that the mirror opposite of what God said was reality. He'll do the same with you. Be prepared and don't be deceived by him and his deceptive work. The peaceable fruit of righteousness is, in fact, our faith exercising because of the Lord's chastening and becoming fruitful again in the family and the service of God. In verses 12 and 13, well, let me read them before comment, commenting on them. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down on the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Paul begins here with the bad reaction to faith or to chastening. 
discouragement. <laughs> I love the image that he draws of, of uh, the discouraged person who, who is, when he's chastened of the Lord, he doesn't listen to the love that drives that chastening. He only feels the pain and disappointment. The Lord's not happy with me. And Paul says, stop, lift that head up, lift those hands up, consider only sons in the family of God are chastened. You are chastened. You, my friend, are a child of the king. Why should you let your head and your hands hang down? Rejoice that you're a child of the king and count the opportunity now to learn from that chastening to glorify him. And the next verse takes us in the correct and righteous way of chastening from hung down hands and feeble knees to straight paths for the Lord. Yes, for the Lord. Then there's a warning. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. There are two responses to chastening in these two verses. We may ignore chastening, continue with hung down heads and feeble knees and hands. No change will be spiritually lame, not fruitful, and we will be turned out of the way. Not turned out of the family of God, but turned out of the way of blessing and fellowship with the Lord and his people will be pointed to a very lonely, unfulfilling life. You want it? Think twice and think seriously. If we follow the right way, repentance is the faith response. Let it be healed. Let, Paul says. Allow it. Promote healing with what you do. You can promote spiritual healing the same as you can promote physical healing, or you can hinder or downright prevent spiritual healing as you can downright prevent physical healing. You have a scratch or a cut on your hands. You can apply, you can clean it, which is the first thing you should do, and apply some kind of good, healthy first aid ointment and cover it with a sterile band-aid and take good care of it till it heals. Or you can leave it uncovered and every time your body tries to create its own band-aid and grows a scab to seal it so it can heal, just take your fingernails and pick and pick and pick till you tear the scab off and it bleeds and opens up all over again for foreign bodies, germs, and what all sorts of things to get into your body. You can do one or the other. Paul says in this case, what we should use common sense in even in our natural lives, rather let it be healed. Do the things that allow healing to occur in your spirit. I love dearly a verse from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? They have balm. They have a physician who prescribes the right balm for their problem and yet they continue sick. Why is Jeremiah's question? You know why? Paul answers it in our study verse. They're not allowing the healing process the Lord has set forth to work in their lives. They're interfering it. They're preventing it. Let's take God's medicine, follow God's prescription, and let healing occur. The first step for that healing is repentance. Listen and come and reply, respond to the Lord's chastening. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace. To follow peace in this case 
Lawanita defined the New Testament Greek word translated follow here as to do something with intense effort and with definite purpose or goal. You can't be casual and follow peace and holiness in this verse. <laughs> it's impossible. You could be casual and follow peace with the folks who agree with you, who who, who sing in, in your uh, cheering squad. But if you want to follow this passage, how are you going to treat the folks who disagree with you? Believers in Christ who yet yeah, disagree with you, you're going to have to work a little harder. You're going to have to work with the, de the definition intense effort, and you're going to have to work with a definite purpose or goal to have peace with your brothers and sisters in the family of God. And holiness is how we, we establish ourselves and develop a relationship with the Lord. Peace toward our brothers and toward the Lord himself, for that matter, and holiness toward the Lord. Peace, Lalanita defines as favorable circumstances that involve peace and tranquility. Our pursuit is this favorable relationship with all, follow peace with all men, not just with our best friends or just with those who agree with us. Work hard at it. That's, that's clearly the message Paul gives us here. Now, the culture we live in has made it very clear in the last five to ten years, and very especially the last two years, that you are not only permitted but encouraged to downright hate anyone who disagrees with you. As believers in God, friends, are we going to let the culture, the corrupt and broken culture of this world, tell us how to, to do God's business? Or, will, or let God be our example. Holiness, contrary to common belief about the word, does not define sinless perfection, but intense dedication to God. If we follow holiness, we will understand that our faith, our conduct in the faith of Jesus, our goals and objectives in serving in his kingdom is not all about me. It's all about God and putting ourselves in a position to be used by him, dedicated to God. I'd love to give you the full context, but time doesn't permit. In 2 Timothy chapter 2.21, Paul draws a conclusion to an extended and very instructive lesson. He has instructed Timothy to flee from, to avoid men who have ungodly character or who have dedicated lack of soundness in the faith of the gospel. Two of them, named by Paul, had denied the reality of the coming of Jesus. They said the resurrection is past already, and they overthrew the faith of some. They didn't care for the faith of others. They only cared for getting the notoriety of people following them. And so Paul, after telling Timothy, don't be duped by these people, flee, reject, turn away from them, and turn your heart and mind to a study of the word of God, rightly, not wrongly as they, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then here's the conclusion. If a man therefore purge himself from these, these, what or who? These men, these people, and people like them, who knowingly depart from the faith of the gospel and draw disciples after themselves, it's all about me and who I can get to follow me, not all about God. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Look at that list. This whole verse is conditional. If thus he shall be, if a man purge himself from these, he shall be this vessel so honorable to God and so fruitful and beneficial to the people of God. 
If he does not purge himself from these, he becomes a vessel of dishonor and unfruitful in all of these areas. Are we willing to do this? We must do this if we hope to become a vessel of honor to the Lord. He must purge himself from these negative ideas like a corruption of the second coming and the doctrine of the resurrection. There's so much questionable teaching in the world today about the second coming of Jesus and what lies ahead, this big global, as theologians call it, doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine of final things in today's world that many pastors have literally resigned themselves to giving up on preaching anything about the resurrection of Jesus other than a fairly superficial and repeated Easter sermon once a year. Lord, forgive. That's the heart and throb of the gospel. You know, the people that promote the ideas are just as much to be purged from the faithful and fruitful believer as the ideas themselves. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Looking diligently, looking, watching carefully, guarding very carefully, like, like a watchman on, a, on the walls in a military establishment at night, guarding against bad outcomes. The result of whatever happens when we're on the lookout post is ours, my friends. It's easy in a broken world with broken people and broken ideas. It's easy to become disillusioned or to become bitter and contribute to the literally cause bad outcomes. We're so busy licking our wounds, feeling sorry for ourselves, being angry and envious at others or whatever we're doing that we don't even fulfill our watchman's role and adversarial forces invade not only us, but the people we love. And we were supposed to pr protect them. We didn't. Looking diligently, for what reason? Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Notice carefully, I, I say it often, let me take advantage of this moment, I dearly love the precise language God inspired to be used in his book. We, don't, we fail the grace of God. The grace of God never fails us. Two practical examples that will make the point Paul is teaching here on the positive side. In Acts 13, 43, Paul and Barnabas were preaching and teaching believers in a synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. The conclusion of an extended and rich message in Acts 13 in verse 43 is they persuaded these people to continue in the grace of God. In Colossians 4 verse 6, Paul, as one of his important closing admonitions to the Colossian church, let your speech be always seasoned with grace. To the believers in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas identify conduct that equals the grace of God. Let your conduct be so structured and, and so, so designed that it exudes grace, graciousness toward other believers and graciousness toward God. Not arrogance, not harshness, things that encourage and honor God and bless his people. To the Colossian church, Paul focused on speech. It's possible that the Colossians were becoming a little careless with their speech, saying things that hurt, that tore down, that denigrated or discouraged other believers. I know, Paul says, let there's no excuse under any circumstance on always let your speech be seasoned with grace. Encourage and be gracious in speech and in conduct. 
how can I help others over myself? That's really the big question of the day. It's the question here. It's the question we've seen in many other places in the New Testament. I suggest it is next to impossible for us to work for the good of someone, a brother or a sister in the faith, at the same time we're actively bitter of heart against them. You can't do both. So what do we do? Take care of the bitterness and be, show the goodness of grace toward them. Paul's very specific. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Root, not stalk, not leaf, not blossom or bloom. A root may linger long, long seasons. It's underground. It's invisible Sometimes, in this case, even to us. It's my root, but it lingers down underneath the surface. I don't even know and recognize I have it before it springs up and goes to work. What happens when it goes to work? What's its fruit? It's the result of the fertile soil we gave it when we failed the grace of God. When we fail the grace of God, whatever the course or our thinking, we are justified in doing so. Whenever that happens, we open the door for bitterness that will surely follow. Sometimes it's bitterness toward life. I just, life's just not fair with me. I, I don't know what's going on. It, it's just not fair. It may be bitterness toward other people. Well, he, he has A, B, and C, and I wanted it, and I deserve it more than he does. Why does he have it, and I don't? I'm not happy. Or it may, if we allow it to continue unchecked in our lives, even give us that bitter spirit toward our brothers and sisters in the faith. That's bad, but the final chapter of bitterness is far, far worse and if you've been a pastor, you've seen it, you've, you've heard it, you've dealt with it. If we allow this bitterness, which has hidden deep down inside for so long until it springs to life and goes to work in our behavior and words and attitudes, we can become bitter toward God. Let me give you a passage that will make that point. It'll make another point, which I want to emphasize as well. Not only will bitterness turn us against life, other people, family members, people we work with, and even our brothers and sisters in the faith, and even toward God, it will turn us away from God to idolatry. Let me read it. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18 lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe. <laughs> he covers it all, doesn't he? Whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, idolatry. Now notice the last clause in the verse. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall, and wormwood, bitterness, bitterness to the core. It all goes together, and it's all a bad package. It springs up. It's like a weed. It doesn't need special care or encouragement or, or, or anything else. It just springs up. We, we give it the opportunity when we ignore it instead of dealing with it and getting rid of it. Its first step will be that it troubles you. It causes hardship to you. It continually annoys you, and it very likely will put you in a frame of mind to annoy the believers around you. And it'll keep on until it downright harasses you into, into silliness and, and, and anger and things that you would never think about doing in a godly mind. It poisons your thoughts toward others, toward life, and toward God. 
And finally, it spreads. Many be thereby defiled. It doesn't just stay with you. If you don't get rid of it, if you allow it to grow and begin to take over your life, sooner or later, it will affect others. Be aware, bitterness is contagious. <laughs> There's been a lot of dispute about how contagious or not this, this virus is. Well, forget about the virus. This bitterness thing is one of the most contagious, defiling, destructive things in existence. It goes after all the people around us that see us infected with it and showing the symptoms of the disease. We are the cause when they become sick. They become defiled. It will cause them to be morally tainted or compromised. We allowed the bitterness to reside in us, but we cause their defilement. Often it will show itself in them as it has manifested itself in us in bitterness, and we caused their bitterness. At that point in verses 16 and 17, Paul uses Esau as a biblical example of bitterness. He caused his own problem. Take note of that. He didn't he wasn't coerced into selling his birthright. He voluntarily sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. That was his action, no one else's. And the language says he found no place. Let me read the whole the, the verse. Well, two of them, 16, 17. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Who did it? Esau did. Scripture confirms the point. For you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I've heard whole sermons preached about Esau repenting of selling and dishonoring his birthright and weeping in remorseful tears over what he had done. I suggest, my friends, please find and give me book chapter and verse in Genesis where you read that, it's not there. There's one instance in the book of Genesis, chapter 27, verses 35 to 40, where Esau wept. But it wasn't weeping for personal repentance. He was weeping in his effort to persuade Isaac to repent, not himself, to, because Isaac had given the blessing to Jacob and would not retract it and give it to Esau. That's the only weeping and the only repentance mentioned. So this man Esau, was his character was exactly what Paul describes it as being in inspired scripture. He was a profane person who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Quite often, to be honest, Esau is an instructive example very clearly in this point. The, I, I suggest, the chief evidence of bitterness is that we blame others for our problems, kind of like Esau did. So friends, if we look at this lesson tonight and we try to find a good lesson for us, what do we choose? Who will be our example. <laughs> and, and Paul gives us a nice, vivid contrast. Who will be our example? Jesus or Esau? Choose carefully. Once you choose your companion in this path, in this venture, you may live with that companion for a very long time. <laughs> So be careful, be careful which option you choose. Thank you for studying with me. 
I, I marvel that God so richly and clearly and simply gives us his word of instruction and teaching that guides us. Yes, Hebrews 12 is the faith handbook for New Testament believers and how instructive, how helpful, how timely it is for us today. God bless you for studying with me. I'm so thankful to have you with me each Wednesday evening. Pray the Lord will bless our thoughts together for your help and growing in the grace of Jesus in your words and in your conduct as Paul has admonished in the passages we examined. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for tonight, for the study of such a rich lesson that you left for us and you have preserved for your people for over 2,000 years. Thank you that we can turn to it and read it today and we can see in it lessons for us, lessons we need to learn, lessons we need to practice. Father, forgive us when, when we have ignored the stinging reality of, of chastisement and refused to listen to the loving voice of our Father. Give us grace today to learn from that failure in the past and to learn well that you chastened us because you loved us and you wanted us to be more attuned to and blessed by your love and your grace in our lives. Help us, Father, to grow according to your instruction in these teachings and thereby to be fruitful in the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Help us to be exercised by that chastening to produce that fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you for studying with me. Lord willing, we'll meet, and His will, we'll continue this study on Sunday morning. God bless.